here in this, in this very room is the university co-chair is Carol Runyon here, and then the agency co-chair is Stan Kothraki at the Office of Behavioral Health. So each one of these groups has two people, one from a state agency, one from the university, and the university people, those six, so I can sort of ride herd and run around and I'm only across the street. I can go knock on doors and I can sort of try to keep things together and, and I'm, I'm the glue guy in the middle, the unfunded glue guy in the middle of that is where the sort of this. And we feed into the Attorney General has a task force that used to be the state meth task force, if you ever heard of it. Uh, they had a meth task force for eight or ten years. They've converted that in the last legislative session to the state substance abuse trend and response task force because it's not just about meth, it's not just about opioids, it's about heroin, it's about opioids, it's about benzos, it's about alcohol, it's about spice, it's about all these things. So they're now trying to take a much more broad approach that it's not just any one substance, it's substance abuse. And so we're a subcommittee of that larger, you know, we have the year of the legislature, the attorney general, law enforcement community. This ours, is, as you can tell, it's pretty much health practitioner, patient, and agency heavy. We don't have a lot of law enforcement, but it's our connection to the legislature and law enforcement is to report and work with them. So we thought that was the best way to try to do it. Because sometimes it's uneasy bedfellows when you try to say, hi, we're going to have the police here working with the positions. We want to look at you and what you're doing. It gets a little uneasy. So we're trying to keep things in a workable model that, that we can, can use going forward. That's how we're going to try to implement this whole darn thing. The work groups, you know, the slides, you'll get a copy of these. I'll provide this so you can see who was on them, at least when we, when we formed them. This was populated from a spreadsheet that came over, and the spreadsheet's updated, and so some of these names have moved around, but there's these groups. Our goal is to take this one-year plan, which is really more of a year-and-a-half or two-year plan, and convert this into something that we think it's going to take five or seven years to start to turn the nose of the ship. It's going to be like drunk driving or anything else where you're not going to solve that problem overnight. It's something where we're going to need time, we're going to need a lot of concerted effort over a long period of time. So we don't think we can wave something at this for a year and the problem's going to go away. So we want to try to project out for uh, three to five more years beyond this additional strategic plan. So we're going to shoot for, see we have seed monies from the, the governor and the attorney general. The attorney general gave us $1.1 million of his money, discretionary budget money, and said, go do public awareness. So we're, you'll see, in the fall probably, you'll see a public awareness campaign launched towards this problem to make people aware of it. Let's say he wants to uh, raise awareness as one of his, his key uh, objectives. Uh, intermediate terms is where I'm going now, so I'm just having a lot of meetings with local and state foundations. I'm going to go to New York and meet with the Clinton Foundation in a couple of weeks and try to get money from foundations to match what the AG gave us and see if we can't get more money that way. And then ultimately apply for a NIDA Center grant to give us you know, three to five years of funding for both education, research, and, and community involvement to do these things in a meaningful way. We have a research component, an education component within the schools and the curricula, and then the stuff that we're already doing. So that's, I think, important for the, for the long term. And we, we, you know, these work groups are ongoing. We have monthly meetings and calls and such, and I'm developing a website. But anybody that wants to get involved, that's my last point I want to make is that anyone who wants to get involved in any way, student, practitioner, no matter who you are, contact me. I will plug you into one of these groups. The groups are open to participation from anyone and completely transparent. The meetings that are taken will be posted on this website. So it's a transparent process that we're using for, this, for the state of Colorado is who we're, who we're representing. So we welcome any involvement. If you want to, uh, to get involved yourself, just let me know and we'll put you to work. So with that, sorry, I went over by about five minutes my target, but I'll take uh, additional questions if you have them. So what legislation is coming through this session? This, issue? this session we have uh, one major piece of legislation, the p and Enhancement Bill. And it's to bring our PDMP, which is pretty minimalistic and almost died two years ago in Sunset Review. There were some legislators that thought, mm, we don't need that thing, so we should kill it. We spent time just trying to keep it alive, much less enhance it. And now we have an enhancement bill to do things like we can't do. Docs can't delegate access to a, an agent. You can have a, someone calling a prescription for you. You can have somebody call for lab results for you. You cannot have somebody look up in the PDMP for you. We're trying to change that. Go for uh, unsolicited reporting, which is a cornerstone of a lot of successful programs. Uh, using the P PDMP data as a public health tool, letting CDPHE have PHI protected anonymized data so we don't know about the individual uh, IDs of individual patients or providers, but we can do spatial mapping and we can tell where problems are much better than we can now. Um, that's a big one. Um, what's the other enhancement? There were three or four different things that we were doing with the, the PDMP. I can't remember all the whole list. But that work group made a bunch of recommendations, met with Senators Newell, 
and Kafalis and Representatives McCann and Primavera, who are carrying the legislation on the House and Senate side, are bipartisan and now has the support of all the major medical societies who've been going around to get their support. And so that's, that's, that's our major piece of legislation this year. One uh, user problem is uh, multiple names, multiple addresses, having a hard time matching people. Are there efforts within this bill to do that? Uh, not, not within the bill. It's more of a technical issue. We do have that users group meeting that I mentioned. If anybody in here is a clinician but it, that uses the PDMP and you want to give input, there's a meeting on February 19th and contact me if you want to be involved in it. It's February 19th, 2 to 4 in the afternoon at the School of Pharmacy and we're having the vendor here, Dora and a collection of docs, nurses, pharmacists, everybody who's licensed to use the PDMP and look people up. And if you have any input like that, and if you're a user, then please let me know if you want to come. You had mentioned in our conversation about the lack of an incinerator, which I found very interesting in Colorado. What, what efforts are being made in that regard, or what are the plans? It's a difficult thing. We take back all the drugs, and the DEA does these take backs, and they get like 80,000 to 100,000 pounds of drug every time they do a take back. We thought, well, it'll taper off. It's not, because we think the awareness is just still going, and it's, and it's growing and growing. We haven't reached yet, you know, tapped into all that supply. And then, you know, with that kind of supply per year, you don't really ever get rid of it all. Because more just keeps coming in. Like the epidemiologist bathtub, you know, you don't turn off the faucet. I don't care what we do with the drain. You know, that's why I love, I love the faucet and the drain thing with incidents and problems. But if the, 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 the faucet is still on. So we have to work on the faucet and we have to work on the drain. But as far as taking back, we do the DEA take back, collected up all this stuff, and it was sitting in seven semi truck tractor trailers at the DEA office. So I went out and visited my friend out there and said, Try and see it. You know, how big was this? We went out there one day and she said, Look at this. Seven tractor trailers in the DEA compound said, well, where are you taking it? We don't know. Okay. There is no incinerator in Colorado for, prop for disposal of controlled substances. So they talked to their friends at, at Buckley Air National Guard, and they flew helicopters down to Centennial Airport. Under armed guard, they trucked these seven semis in the middle of the night over to Centennial Airport under cover of darkness. And the Rappo County Sheriffs and, and the people from Buckley and there's you know really military guys in trucks with guns, like taking these semis over the air, over the airport, loading it all up onto these helicopters, and they helicoptered it all to Utah, and they comped us, the Utah incinerator people comped us the disposal. They could have charged us, said, sorry, it's you know it's hundred thousand dollars to to burn it up. So they just they just comped it to us. But we know there's a long-term problem. We need to retrofit one incinerator to be EPA compliant with this, costs about $500,000. So if anybody has half a million, that's, that was one of my asks to Colorado Health Foundation. I'm asking Clinton, Clinton Foundation, anybody want to, will you give me a half a million? We can, we can retrofit one incinerator to do it. Still won't pay for running it, won't pay for the employee that's needed to do the tracking. Like said, there's ongoing you know, marginal costs on top of that, but the fixed cost is a half a million to retrofit one incinerator. We think we need two. What was the comparison cost of getting all of those? prescription drugs to Utah. As yep. to Absolutely. Okay. And, and I don't know if they've done the time in motion. I'm sure the people at Buckley know the time in motion pretty darn well. If they're military, they know how they, you know, they know what it costs to move, you know, anything, anywhere. They're very good at time in motion. But then they donated that. It was the Air National Guard folks that, that, at Buckley that donated that time. But again, there is a cost. Right. It's just at this point, DEA is sponsoring those. Local law enforcement is donating their, everybody's donating their time. And there's real cost to it. So the thought is that eventually there's going to have to be some system where it's either taxed through the pharmaceutical manufacturers or through people as user fees going back to be able to pay for the reverse channel of distribution. It's just a matter of how do you do it. It's going to be a bloody policy discussion. Alameda County in Oakland passed a law. It's an ordinance in Alameda County that pharmace pharmaceutical companies have to do market share take back, pay for it. If they, if they dispense... 40% of the opioids, like Purdue Pharma, into um, Alameda County. They have to pay for 40% of the take back of all the opioids from Alameda County. And immediately, Pharma, the National Pharma Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association filed a, court, uh, filed a challenge in court. And so it's hung up in federal court right now. So it's, there's an injunction on it. But there, there are jurisdictions trying to force Pharma to take the stuff back. And then they'll just, you know, again, they'll pass the cost through. It's one of those right on us. It's a pay me now, pay me later kind of thing. The cost will go up. The cost, there is a cost to disposing of it. Right now, the cost is environmental. Speaking of which, there's a CE program on Saturday morning. For all of you that are interested, if you want more on this, about pharmaceuticals and the environment, about 30 steps down here in the, in the big lecture hall on Saturday from 8 to noon, we're doing a program on pharmaceuticals and the environment and the reasons why we need safe take back and what we can try to do about it. 
So we're following this up with a variety of educational programming. Great question. Yes. How do you see uh, medication-assisted treatment, specifically methadone, We have one work. It's a treatment work group that's trying to identify for us what are the barriers to a lot of them. We know capacity is one of them, but what are the effective you know, barriers to effective treatment? Identification from pe people upstream through screening in primary care, probably like expert type screening for this. How do we do a better job of that? Because expert uptake for prescription drugs is abysmally low. That in general. But expert for prescription drugs is, is new and the uptake is tiny. But we need to do better everything from screening all the way through the spectrum of care to referral and, and getting people into treatment and, and increasing capacity for treatment, which the capacity just can't handle. If we try to put everybody, the 21 million into treatment, then we can't do it. And you know, I mean, the weight is, sorry, unless you're paying, unless you've got 30 grand and can pay for a month, you're, you're not, there, is, there are no beds. So it's, it's a very complicated. So they're, they're producing basically a, a set of white papers for us to say, hey, for payers, here's things you could do. For, for legislators, here's what you could do. For treatment providers and, and so that with professional associations and the schools, here's what you could do. So we're trying to at least, because you know, they don't have, we don't, as far as the group, we don't have any policy making authority. We don't have any money. Other than that, we have a lot. We have no money and no authority. And we're trying to make change. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to do. Are there sure. any lessons to be learned internationally? Internationally, believe it or not, the, the problem internationally is largely believed to be a non-issue. Europe doesn't think they have a problem. They're farther behind than we are. There's uh, folks down at Denver Health uh, that run a program called RADARS, the Research Abuse and Drug yeah. something. I forget what their, their acronym stands for. Uh, but basically, they, they research drug abuse and related things through a variety of data sources and produce reports for pharmaceutical companies, state governments, whatever. But they work as 501c3 under Denver Health. Their system, they're expanding internationally because they go internationally and people don't think this is an issue at all internationally. So we don't have a lot of international precedent. Did the, the issues around pain management, did that create international medical practice at the same time as it did? It has been. It seems to have been following in terms of those things. Mm -hmm. But they seem to be about 12 to 15 years behind. They're still talking about under treatment and expanding that and the whole thing and pharma's aggressively marketing. They seem to just be you know, behind the wave internationally. So Radars is over there saying, look, it's a problem. We can help you document it. We can help you with the data and show you that it's a problem. And you know, but, but they're trying to raise awareness as well. They just hired somebody to do international initiatives entirely, you know, based here in, in Denver, but doing work for international uh, groups and audiences. Well, thanks. I'm sorry I went over. And uh, thank you all for coming.